I'm going to go right to the word of the Lord this morning. Our summer series here on Sunday mornings has actually just simply been called Jesus. You've seen the sign on the board out front, Jesus. Uh, this is actually the fifth lesson in these series, if you are counting. And uh, the Lord laid this on my heart. Uh, it's not been promoted in a big way. I don't know anything more important we could talk about on Sunday morning than Jesus. And we've actually been interrogating the eyewitnesses, people who actually knew him people who walk with him. Our first two lessons were actually on uh, Matthew. Uh, uh, we did an introductory lesson. Last time we, we uh, interrogated John, John the Beloved. John was the youngest of the disciples. John actually did not write his gospel until he was almost 100 years old, about 70 years after the uh, death and resurrection of our Lord. John had had a lot of time to think about what it was he wanted to say and what it was he wanted you and I to know. But even though that he thought it through thoroughly, and he dwelt oftentimes upon the Lord in the times that he spent with him, it was the Holy Spirit at work in him, keeping the promise that he said, Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, a comforter will not come, the comforter will not come. But when he comes, he will remind you, he will bring to your remembrance the things that I've told you. So it was not just the memory of John the Baptist, but the inspiring work of the Holy Spirit that said you ought to write this book in this way. And John tells us things as a witness that no other witness has told us. And so even though that I could, and I don't say this to impress you with my knowledge, it's just there. I could spend many weeks or months on each of these gospels, but I'm just looking for some things that are rare and unique. Uh, and, and some people are perplexed. The world is perplexed that all of the gospels are not exactly the same. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I celebrate the fact that the Holy Spirit went to each witness and caused them to bring out things that the other may have neglected or overlooked or not emphasized in the same kind of way. So we get a broader view of who Jesus really is. The question is not, did Jesus exist? History, secular, ungodly history record the fact that he was born and lived. You can actually find it in a lot of Roman Empire uh, historical records. Uh, Jesus did live. That's not the question. The question is, who was he? Who is this Jesus? When you begin to answer that question, that's when the controversy arises because Jesus either is who he said or he is a, a lunatic. He either is the Son of God, that's who he said he was, or as one writer said, he's a man that he, you could equate him with a man who says that he was a uh, potato. Uh, and so when you begin to answer that question, then the world gets really upset. But this is the fundamental question that John the Beloved is dealing with in the writing of his gospel, and he provides for us compelling eyewitness testimony as to who Jesus really, really is. And I want to remind you uh, of what we said last time as to why he wrote the book. John actually says, this is the purpose for my writing the book. In John chapter 20, verse 31, he says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John actually wants to awaken the faith in unbelievers and to sustain faith in those of us who actually believe he is who he said he is. And so, uh, just by way of a little bit of an introduction, I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to just list for you seven things, but because we have so much in front of us and such little time, I'm only going to be able to deal with a few of these, but some you will intuitively know something about. One of the things that John really singles out is Jesus' constant reference to himself as being I am. He would say I am, and then we follow it with some qualifier and say I am this or I am that. And in doing so, our Lord hearkened back to a time whenever Moses was singled out by God to deliver the nation of Israel. And, and, and some theologians, many would say that Moses is an Old Testament type of Christ because he was a deliverer who would set the people free. And Jesus came to deliver you and I from our sins and set us free. And the Word of God said, who the Son has set free is free indeed. And so whenever God shows up to Moses and sends him on this assignment, Moses is very pragmatic and he says, suppose, this is actually found in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13, Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Who shall I say sent me? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am 
who I am. That's what you say to the Israelite. I am has sent me to you. And he, he doesn't just end it there. But God also said to Moses, say to the Israelite, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He was saying this just for clarification. He said, this is the God who has sent me to use. And then tell them, this is my name forever. This is the name you shall call me from generation to generation. My name is I am. That's what you call me. You want to know my name? Call me I am. That is my name for all generations. And now we have Jesus walking here among the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and saying, I am. In fact, in one place he says, before Abraham was, I am. And John keeps making note of this. We find in John chapter 6 and verse 35, he said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10 and verse 7 through 9, he said, I am the door of the sheep. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11 and verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. As exciting as that is, I won't even preach on that this morning, but that just thrills me because whenever Lazarus had died and word went out, first word went out to Jesus, he was off in a revival crusade somewhere far away and word came to Jesus that Lazarus, whom thou lovest, is sick. And the Bible said that Jesus didn't do a thing. He just, we would say, the young people would say he just hung out. He didn't immediately leave. It, the Bible didn't say he was preaching or ministering or healing the sick. He just hung out and a few days later word came that Lazarus was dead and when he found out that Lazarus was dead he went back and the sisters ran out and said if you had been here our brother would not have died and Jesus said he will live again and they said we know we know we know he will live again in the resurrection and see we've got that idea that the resurrection is a is a date on a calendar it's a particular assigned date and and we've got that idea that on some date not only to God then people like my dad who went to sleep in the Lord then they'll be resurrected and we've got this idea and Jesus said he'll live again and they said we know We've been paying attention. We know that he will live again that day in the resurrection. And at that point, he gave this incredible revelation to those sisters. He said, look, look, you're, not, you're going to have a hard time embracing this, but I am the resurrection. He was constantly revealing himself as who he is. He was saying, listen to me, girls. He is, resurrection is not a time on a calendar. Resurrection is me. I am the reason that Lazarus has gone. He said, show me where you've laid the boy. And somebody said, he's been dead four days, to which he said, no problem. I don't need any usable parts. After all, I am the resurrection. If there had been nothing left but dirt, I'm just simply saying, I don't know what's going on in the grave of my father or in the grave of your ancestors. I don't know what remains, but I know Trudy, he don't need a thing to put Bob back together. He is the resurrection. He said, I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. The resurrection and the life. Later in John 14 and, and verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in chapter 15, verse 1 through 5, he said, I am the true vine, and so it goes. And John couldn't help but make note of that. He keeps, he keeps using that name that Moses said, from now on, this is what you call me. And, he, and Jesus would keep saying, I am, I am, I am. And so John wrote it down. So in John chapter 8 and verse 12 there, he says, Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So I want us to begin. We, I can't deal with all of these claims this morning, and that's what these are. These are claims. He is claiming to be something more than a prophet, something more than a skilled teacher, something more than the son of Mary, and, the, and, and as some would say, the illegitimate son of Joseph. He's saying there's more to me than meets the eye. In fact, I am the light of the world. So we're going to begin with this. If, if this claim is true, this is life-changing. I want you to follow me. If this is true, this is life-changing because he's saying, look, whoever follows me. Now, he's not talking about an afternoon stroll. He didn't invite, when he called the disciples and said, follow me, he wasn't inviting them to lunch. He was saying, lay down your cross 
and follow me. Deny yourself and follow me till you die. He's, to, he's looking for a lifetime commitment. He said, anybody who joins himself to me, anybody who follows me, if you follow me, it's not simply that you're going to be working and walking in the light. He's saying, if you follow me, you will have me. What did he say? He said, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light. You will have me, and I am the light. Everything changes. This is life changing if this is true. So what does it mean when Jesus said, I am the light of God? the world being the light of the world because he is the light of the world that does not mean that all darkness is removed from the world because he showed up the whole world is not being lightened in fact he said whosoever follows me will not walk in darkness what is the implication there is darkness and the world is full of darkness but if you join yourself to me you won't be walking in darkness you will have the light Capital L-I-G-H-T. Everything changes. So darkness is not suddenly eradicated from the world, but rather there are places where the light is because people have chosen to come into the presence of the almighty light. So I'm going to tell you some things that I believe that it means whenever Jesus says that he is the light of the world. The first thing, I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking to you about darkness. Darkness is not merely the absence of light. It certainly is that. Darkness is a place where light does not exist or if it exists at all, it's in such insignificant amounts it makes it difficulty to see things clearly. Is anybody having a hard time seeing things clearly? Do you ever get perplexed when you glance over toward Washington, D.C. and just wonder what in the world are they trying to do? Do you ever wonder whenever they're printing eight billion dollars a month and we have no gold to back it up if they're thinking about, do you ever just look around you and see what's taking place in the educational systems and the stuff that they're teaching as abject truth? They teach that evolution is a fact and that the word of God is fiction. Do you ever just see that somehow in the world that things are a little bit confused. It's because the world is filled with darkness. See, something needs to dispel the darkness. Have you ever tried to navigate through the house whenever the lights were out? And, and you think you have your bearings and you think you know where you are, but because of darkness, you, you just run into stuff and you don't make it from point A to point B. Have you ever tried to solve a problem, but you were lacking in understanding? One of the definitions of the word darkness applies to the so-called dark ages, when people just simply were void of understanding and truth was hidden from them because the Bible, Bible was not yet being printed and there was a time of darkness that literally covered the face of the earth. Whenever I'm allowed to go overseas, to a place like uh, Linda and I were on the, in the slums of Kibera in Kenya. I, I, I'm, I'm caught off guard because in our naivete, sometimes we don't really want to give generously to people in other countries because we say, why can't they just plant a garden? Why don't they just raise some goats? Why don't they just milk a cow? I mean, my God, we, we ought to just teach those people to fish and stop giving. You don't understand what generations and thousands of years of darkness does to a country. It literally poisons the land. The, 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 it won't grow. The water is poisoned. If you cut yourself over there, it won't heal. You ought to go sometime. I'm telling you, it has been cursed by the blight of darkness and the absence of the activity of the Spirit of God for so long, the earth will not grow and bear fruit. The water is poison and can't drink it. And, 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 and you cannot imagine what extended fi darkness finally does to everything. And so I believe that to say that Jesus is the light of the world, it says three things. First of all, it does not say that Jesus is one of the lights. And we talk about a lot of enlightenment and a lot of ideas that seem to enlighten people. But I want you to understand that we don't enlighten the world by bringing them democracy. And we don't enlighten the world by bringing them our kind of medical care. And we don't enlighten, we, the only thing that brings light, Jesus is the only light of the world. Listen, it's either Jesus or darkness. It's either Jesus or blackness. It's either him and there is no other light. You need to hear and understand that. Give him praise in the house. 
I know it doesn't make everybody happy, but Buddha is not the third alternative. Muhammad is not the third alternative. You need to understand these other, these other so-called gods that have been set up. They are demons masquerading as enlightenment and as angels of light. They, it is... If somebody somewhere does not speak the truth with resounding clarity, billions of innocent people will die and go to hell. It is Jesus or darkness. There is no third alternative. Hallelujah. That's point number one. Point number two, since the world is dark and void of light and confused and lacking in understanding, everyone who does not have the light, needs the light. It's a universal need. It is real, it is personal, and since everybody is in darkness and everybody needs a light, that is another way of saying that the whole world needs Jesus. Now listen, if you don't believe that, you don't actually know the real Jesus. You're worshiping the little plastic Jesus on the dash of your car and bowing to the, the nickel-plated cross that hangs around your neck. Because when you come to know the Jesus who breathed the fiery breath that flung the stars into their orbits and said, let there be light, and made everything that there is and without him was not anything made that was made. John the Beloved said, you haven't met him because when you meet him, you will understand that everyone needs him. Hallelujah. He is that kind of light. If you follow him now, even while others are stumbling in darkness, you will have him as your light. Now get this. It's true that as soon as his light shines into your life, it reveals our sinfulness. See, the rest of the world is plunging headlong into eternal damnation, and they don't even know it. But as soon as his light shines on you, then it reveals your sin. And I realize that seems awful. And we're talking about that on Wednesday night uh, in, in our discipleship series. But it seems awful that this light reveals our sin. It's not. It's, it's the good news. It's the good news of the gospel. It's like going to the doctor to get your annual physical and he finds out that you got cancer. But he said, it's good news. We caught it early. See, whenever you, the light shines on you now and you find out that you got the sin cancer, that's good news because you catch it early and you bow before the cross and accept the blood of Jesus and you're forever healed and forever delivered. See, that's the good news. That's the good news. That's the good news. That he is merciful and he shines his light. He is the light that shines in darkness, John said, and the darkness comprehended it not. His light is shining all around you. Don't ignore it. Comprehend it. Recognize it. Allow it to reveal your lostness. And in the process, you will see the history of redemption at work in your own salvation. Nothing will be the same again when you have him as your light. The third thing that I want to tell you is once you begin to walk in the light, everything changes. How everything looks is different. One of the things that's broken in the modern church is that we get saved and things don't change. We're not grateful. I understand, I understand how lost people are ungrateful. I don't understand how you can be ungrateful for anything once you're saved. We sing the little song that says, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Thomas said, Lord, just let us see the Father. That'll be enough for us. Jesus said, if you've seen me, the, you've seen the Father, Thomas. Is that enough? Is that enough? And he bowed and said, my Lord and my God. You've seen him. You've met him. His light has shined in your life. Is that enough? Everything changes when you walk in the light. The way you see everything changes. The way you observe a simple storm changes. The way you interpret the events of 9-11 changes. The way you interpret the events of a tsunami changes. The way you see the birth of a newborn child changes. 
See, you come to the understanding. I mean, some of you are mature enough in Jesus to know what I'm saying. I'm not a pessimist. I know right now I'm sounding like it. And on Wednesday night, I'm sounding even worse. How in the world can you wear a shirt like this and be a pessimist? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I'll talk about that later. Yeah, this is not the kind of shirt I would pick out for myself. So I had help. I did have help. She's here. She's in the house. She said, real men wear pink, Papa. It's right there, pink. So I'm putting it to a test. The thing of it is, everything changes, see? Whenever you really understand how dark the world is and how essential the light is, then you actually rejoice at the death and mourn at the birth. Everything is different once you walk in His light because you understand the incredible responsibility and the task of discipleship. I'll be honest with you. I'll, I'll tell you the reason that we ought to be mourning at the birth is because we're falling behind. They are being born faster than we are winning them to Jesus. See, we're, we, every, day, every day that the world lasts, Misty, we fall behind. There are more people going to hell now than there were this time last week. And more people going to hell now than there were this time last year. Because we're falling behind, we're not getting it done. See, it's because we are not seeing. Once we, once we come to him, we see everything, natural disasters and wars and suffering and death. In this light, it will help you. This light will enable you to bear the darkness and the sorrow of the reality of what's taking place around the world. The soft glow of this light will comfort you in your loneliness after the devastating realities that come to us. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So I want to move forward in the interest of time. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I, as we plunge into this one, he said, I am the light of the world. We got that. Now, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, before we unpack this, and this is the last one I'll do today, before we unpack this, remember why John is writing the book. He said, I'm writing the book that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So he's not just another light. He's not one of many lights. He's the only light. And he also said, and I am the way. He's not one of many ways. He is the way. He said, no man cometh to the Father except by me. By the time we get to the 14th chapter of John's gospel, a lot has transpired. He has seen an awful lot in the life and the ministry of our Lord. But at this point, as he begins writing in this 14th chapter of John, they are at the Last Supper. Jesus has just told them that he's going away. And you can't come where I'm going. You cannot go with me, he said. And then he said, and by the way, Peter, you are going to deny me three times tonight. In other words, I'm leaving, and you guys don't even have what it takes to make it one night without me. And having said that, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. He gives them so much to worry about, and then he says, but don't worry. I'm leaving, and you can't make it one night without me, but don't worry. Trust me. That's what he said. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. At its deepest part, he's saying, don't worry. Trust me. Don't worry. Trust me. John 1. John 14, 1. And th so then Jesus says in the next verse, don't be troubled. Instead, trust me and trust God. So I'm going to give you three reasons why you should not be troubled. Now, I'm telling you, we live in troubled times. Tr trying again not to be pessimistic, trying to be just realistic. I mean, don't we all get the idea that we trust in the American economy, man, we trust in it. The, the reason, uh, do you remember whenever uh, Ross Perot, the guy with the big ears, was running for president? Yeah, he would always say, I'm all ears. He said, go ahead, I'm listening, I'm all ears. He was. 
But he is the one that said America's greatness did not lie in her military prowess, but rather in her economic strength. And when our economic strength goes, so will our military might. How many of you know that our economic might is hanging by a thread? I mean, do you know that? Do you really know it? Do you know how much money we all owe? I mean, it is so not funny. It is so not funny. We are like set up to become slaves. If the borrower is a slave to the lender, we owe so much money to the world and to a world that doesn't like us very much. I mean, I'm not going to plumb the depth of that. I'm just simply saying, we are troubled. We are troubled in a global sense. We are troubled in a national sense. We're troubled in a local sense. We're troubled at home. Do you get it? We're troubled at home. We're in so much trouble. But he is saying, do not let your heart be troubled. Trust me. Here's the first reason that we ought to trust him. He said, trust me because there is room for you. In my father's house are many mansions. That's what the King James Version says. That's the one I prefer because I want a mansion. Hey, man, that's the church of God way. I was raised up that way. In my, but, but what it actually said in my father's house are many rooms. I don't know how you feel about it, but I would much rather live in his house than I would live in his neighborhood. I mean, if my kids came home, they all live nearby, but they used to have to travel a long way. I don't know how you all would have felt if I just said, here, here's your key. I got your room down to Motel 6. They left the light on for you. <laughs> At least you're in the neighborhood. When you sleep in my house and you're one of the kids, you get access to the refrigerator. Hey, man, 24-7. And Linda always stocks us when the kids are coming home. If she hears that they're coming over, she says, we got to go to Kroger's. I say, why? She said, the kids are coming over. It's okay, honey. They probably ate before they left home. But I figured out they don't. <laughs> they do not. Because they're pretty sure she'll have it stocked with their favorite stuff. Stocked with their favorite stuff. He said, in my father's house are many rooms. Don't fear. Don't let your, listen to me, don't let your shame trouble you. Don't let your circumstance be bothersome to you. In my father's house, there is plenty of room. Trust me. You trust God, trust me. There will be a place for you in your father's house as children forever. Listen to this. So Peter and all of us fragile saints who follow Jesus so imperfectly. Can I say that again? So Peter, Peter, sworn, I'll take a sword, I'll cut off somebody's ear, I will never abandon you, don't you worry, Jesus, I'll be right with you. He's the same guy that's standing there cooling himself, warming himself by the enemy's fire. They say, aren't you one of his? No, I've never seen the guy. No, not me. I know you're one of him. You even talk like him. Just to prove the point, he cussed a big string because he didn't want to be mistaken as being associated. So in his shame and in his imperfect way of following Jesus, they were troubled. You're going away and we don't know where you're going. Jesus said, don't worry. Don't be troubled because I will take care of you. And to all of us who follow him with such imperfection, Jesus is saying to us, look, there is room. Do you remember that song? Is anybody old enough to remember the song that says, there's room at the cross for you. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Listen, it's not crowded. There will always be space. There's a place for you in my Father. There's room in his house. And John 1 and 12 said, And as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the children of God. There's room. He said, Don't be troubled, because you're not going to show up and find out that we've turned your room into an office. There is room. Number two. Don't be troubled because I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, I've got some insight for you, and I'll be honest, it didn't come from me. I do a lot of reading and a lot of studying and a lot of research, and when I found this, 
it was one of those moments where I just kind of turned a flip-flop. Does your soul ever just turn a flip-flop? Because I found something that I like better than what I had. I've actually used this at funerals. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And I use that at funerals and I've used it to say, don't worry. Here they are. They are dead. But don't worry. He'll come back and take them to heaven. We all go, thank you, Jesus. We are going to heaven. This verse is not about going to heaven. And it's not about him going away to prepare heaven. Have you thought about it? But this writer asked the question, do you really think that heaven is in a constant state of construction and they're tripping over saw horses and piles of dirt and stuff and have been working for 2,000 years on your, but you just can't get it right? I mean, see, and we've even preached it. You know, he made the whole universe in six days, but my mansion, it's going to be something. They've just been working on that bathroom vanity for the last 2,000 years. We're kind of, we really are making out all that angel construction crew to be a bunch of stumble bums, right? And what we're really saying is things are imperfect in the presence of God. God's having to constantly explain, excuse the ladder in my foyer, we're under construction. Heaven's got all these signs and detours because heaven's under construction. I mean, I'm not making fun, but kind of makes sense to me. That's probably not how it is. So Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Actually, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is speaking. He said, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come to you, the blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. So in that verse, he said that it was already ready from the foundation of the world, and now we got him still working on it. So I think that there's an incongruency there that we have to deal with. The house of God is not in disrepair. The sweetness of fellowship of heaven is not disrupted by jackhammers and construction sounds. So what preparation must Jesus have been talking about I'm glad you ask at the time our Lord is speaking sin has not been atoned for Jesus the Lamb of God who would be slain for the sins of the whole world has not yet been slain the wrath of God upon a condemned humankind is yet unsatisfied and in a few hours from that time, about eight or nine hours from the time that our Lord is talking, he is going to go to the cross to become a curse for us, according to Galatians 3.13, and to bear our condemnation, according to Romans 8 and 3, and to endure the bruising of the Father in Isaiah 53.10. Death is yet to be defeated, and Jesus is about to lay down his life and take it up again from the jaws of death and so. Every obstacle, I want you to get this, when Jesus was talking, he was saying, look, there is a place, but you can't get there. See, that's the issue. There is a place, there is room in my father's house, but you can't get there from here, so I'm going to prepare the way. In fact, you might say that I'm going to go install a door. <laughs> He said, I am the door. The door. You got this room, but there's no door. You can't get in. You're not qualified. The barrier of sin, the curse, it's not yet been dealt with. He said, I'm going, and where I'm going, you can't come. I'm going by way of Calvary. In just a few hours, I'm going to take care of this. Trust me, every obstacle between us and your room, everything between here and the barrier between you and the Father's house is going to be removed in the next three days. Jesus confirms what I'm saying to you in verses 4 through 6 when he says, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Verse 5, Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. You getting that? I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. We got some work to do here. I got some work to do here. I've got to go. You can't come, but when I go, trust me, everything will be fine. 
I'm going to open up the way. I am the way. I'm going to confirm the truth. For I am the truth. I am going to purchase your eternal life because I am the resurrection and the life. We do not need to be troubled because we are imperfect, wrath-deserving, unqualified followers of Jesus because this night Jesus is going to purchase our forgiveness and become the door and become the way and reveal the truth and impart the life. Therefore, he says, trust me. I'm going to close with this if someone will come. The third thing he says, and don't be troubled, because when I come, I will, let me just read it in verse 3, chapter 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now, when I really got this, I really liked it. He didn't say, I'm going to come and take you to heaven. We're not just going. That city that John saw was 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles high. 1,500 miles is a long way. Somebody living in California, while we're living here, about 1,500 miles, give or take 100 or two. We don't have really much of a relationship with them. It would be possible to be in the city. He said, I'm not coming to bring you to my town. I'm not coming to bring you to my country. I'm coming to bring you to myself. I want you to get this. Everything just changed. The language, I go to prepare a place for you. There's a room for you in my father's house. But when I come, I will take you to myself. It changes from place to person. I'm not just bringing you to a place, but I'm bringing you to myself. Sometimes I travel and sometimes the guy who invited me to speak says, I'll pick you up at the airport. And sometimes I get to the airport and I'm looking for that familiar face. And I stand there, bags in hand, looking for somebody. Out of the crowd steps a stranger and says, are you Mitchell Toll? Yes. Well, I'm your ride. And I'm like, really? I didn't even come to see this guy here. This is strange. I'm in the right place, but I don't see the right face. And Jesus said, when I come, I will receive you to myself. Don't be troubled. So, well, I thought I was going to heaven. You remember the song? Heaven for me. Heaven for me. Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me? What is the essence of heaven? The real essence of heaven. It's not the architecture, and I've heard it's grand. And it's not the light, and I heard from John the Revelator that it penetrates and pierces, and there is no darkness and there is no shadows, and it flashes and bounces. And the throne itself sits on a shimmering sea of glass. It's not a sea of water that's like glass. It's a sea of glass. That's what John said. But it's not the light display. Heard that there's a tree of life there. Bears all manner of fruits in its season. And a river of life. Sounds wonderful. Mansions, walls of transparent gold and gates of a single pearl. My childhood pastor William Morgan used to say, I'd like to meet that oyster that made that pearl, that made that gate. I don't know about you, but if they let me out and I plunged 
the depth of that city from corner to corner, from river to tree, and mansion to mansion. But when I finished, I hadn't seen him. It wouldn't be heaven to me. My friend Rusty Goodman used to sing a song that said, when you finally make your entrance to that city of jasper walls and bright golden avenues, as you behold all its beauty and its glory, there's just one request I make of you. Look for me. For I will be there too. I realize when you first arrive, there'll be so much to do. But after you've been there 10,000 years, a million, maybe two, look for me. One night I was asleep after Rusty had died and he came to me in my sleep and sang that song. And I woke up crying and my pillow was wet. The second verse said, as you go down your list of first there's no question you'll want to see the one who bled and died for you that's the first when you finally step across out of this troubled world and you know you've made it I've made it when you know you've made it you will know you didn't make it on your own Alex Haley, the author of Roots, said, when you see a turtle on top of his f- a fence post, you can be sure he didn't get there by himself. When you step into that city, one thing you'll know, if it hadn't been for his blood, for his sacrifice, for his willingness to lay his life down on the old rugged cross, for picking it up again, You wouldn't be there. We'll search him out, won't we? We'll search him out. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way you get to God. We'll search for him. They took John and uh, boiled him in oil. They actually did. Put him in a pot. Boiled him in oil. No historical writer talked about that. We don't know how that scarred him. Or if it didn't, we don't know. We know what it should do. It should have killed him. should have boiled his skin right off. It didn't kill him. They did that to him just because after 60 years, 60 years after Jesus was gone, That old bent over man is still telling. All the rest of the disciples are dead. And as the light danced in his eyes, he would tell them, I was there. I was there the night he walked on water. I was there the night the storm arose and he spoke to the sea and said, peace be still. I was there the day that he fed the 5,000 plus the women and children. I was there the day he touched the casket and stopped the funeral parade and told the young man to arise. I was there. I was there. I saw him die on the cross. I was there. See, not all the disciples was there, but John was at the cross. And Jesus looked down from the cross and said, take care of my mother. Mom, move in with John. I took care of Mary until she died. 60 years later, his faith was so unwavering and so unmoving that they just tried to shut him up so they boiled him in oil. It wouldn't kill him. So then they put him in exile on the Isle of Patmos. And you can go to the book of Revelation when it opens. He said, I, John, was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, having a personal encounter and a conversation with Jesus. This eyewitness, I don't know what you do with things like that. I don't know what you do.
when you hear an eyewitness account of somebody who said, look, boil me in oil, cut my head off, doesn't matter. I know what I saw. I know what I saw. It ought to make us want to plumb the depths of this and find out for sure before we just discount it. See, we don't just get to discount it because we'll answer someday. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you because you are the light that we need. Otherwise, we could never comprehend our lostness. We would never even know we needed a Savior except that your life and your light gives us a glimpse so we know. So today I'm praying that your light will shine on some heart. Somebody right now will realize their need of you. And God, that you will speak to them and they will be open and receptive to this truth. I'm also glad to know that you are the way. That you have not left us without a way to get to where you are. You said, I am the way, the door. I am the truth. And God, in a world that constantly asks what is truth and redefine it and reshape it, to fit our circumstance. You are the unchanging truth. The truth that we believe in, the truth that we cling to, and the truth that ultimately will give us eternal life with you. God, reveal that to some heart right now in the name of Jesus.